It's been 31 years since Jeremy Bamber was convicted of multiple murders on the 28th of October 1986. The jury found Jeremy guilty by a 10 to do majority for the shooting of his parents, Neville and June Bamber, his sister, Sheila Caffell, and her six-year-old twin boys, Nicholas and Daniel. Jeremy was sentenced to serve 25 years which was changed to a whole life tariff by Douglas Hurd in 1988. Jeremy Bamber has consistently maintained his innocence for 31 years and in 2007 passed a lie detector test. In 2001 and 2002, in preparation for Jeremy Bamber's second appeal, the judges made two orders requesting Essex Police hand over specific material relating to the case. The police did not fulfil the disclosure orders and without the vital evidence needed to throw reasonable doubt on Jeremy's conviction, the appeal was lost. This new evidence exists because Jeremy's legal team have documents relating to it, documents that were not disclosed until after the 2002 appeal. Before Jeremy's trial, the Director of Prosecutions gave permission for all statements to be edited and it appears the police, in order to prove their case against Jeremy, used this permission carte blanche to alter and withhold information from the defence and the jury. Reminiscent of the Hillsborough case is the number of edits and alterations made to many of the original witness statements taken by Essex Police during the investigation. The first of these documents came into the possession of Jeremy's campaigners in 2011. It refers to a report made by a senior investigating officer, DCI Keneally, which said... The police review concluded that all the evidence showed Sheila Caffell was responsible for the killings at White House Farm. The second important document, along with the audio tapes, is the original handwritten statement of Malcolm Bonnet, a police civilian radio operator. It was he who recorded the dramatic call from Jeremy's father, saying his daughter had gone berserk and had hold of one of his guns. The defence have various copies of Bonnet's logs, as well as a copy of Jeremy's own call written by PC West. One log even distinguishes between Mr Bamber and Mr Bamber Jr. The details of the photocopied logs the defence has seen show they have clearly been altered, because there are different versions and a shocking conclusion has been reached that Jeremy's call and Jeremy's father's call were merged into one. The first police officers on the scene were Sergeant Bewes and PC Mile. They both said they saw movement in the house while Jeremy Bambo was standing outside, beside them. The defence needs the situation report referred to by PC Bewes when he called out the firearms team after he'd seen movement in the bedroom window of the house and the handwritten statements that both of these officers made on the day of the tragedy, 7th of August 1985. These documents do exist because PC Bewes later told the 1986 investigation by D.I. Dickinson that they both wrote out these statements and left them in the in-tray on Detective Sergeant Stan Jones' desk. The earliest witness statement was made by P.C. Mile on the 8th of August 1985 and P.C. Buse's statement followed on the 16th of August 1985. These details are important as they give a date, personnel involved and an indication of what they might have written. The police raid team that stormed White House Farm at 7.40 that morning were wearing open microphones, and the BT operator who intercepted the phone line at the farmhouse said she could hear movement on the line before the police entered. The defence needs to know what the officers saw and said 
when they broke into the house. The audio recordings of the raid are vital evidence, along with the police radio recordings. Also, the pocketbook evidence by PC Milbank, who monitored the phone line at the farm. His identity was not revealed until 2002. It cannot be overstated that the disclosure of the original handwritten police logs and audio recordings by Essex Police are essential to Jeremy's fight for freedom. Although Essex Police claim they fulfil their obligation to make full disclosure of all the evidence, they did not meet the Attorney General's guidelines in 1986, which was to provide any material casting doubt upon the accuracy of the prosecution evidence. All of the documentation and audio recordings Jeremy Bamber is now requesting meet the guidelines set by the 2002 Appeal Court judges. And because Essex Police did not meet these orders, they still stand today. The former MP for Basingstoke, Andrew Hunter, raised the issue of non-disclosure in Parliament in 2005 and he was assured that the Criminal Case Review Commission would be able to get the material from Essex Police. As the documents were never produced, in 2012 the Criminal Cases Review Commission again tried to obtain one of the logs under a powerful disclosure law known as Section 17, but Essex Police told them the item could not be located. Every time Jeremy, his defence team and campaigners have tried to obtain the documents needed to cast doubt on his conviction, Essex police say writing letters refusing people's requests is a drain on public resources. The baffling, controlling mindset of non-disclosure goes to the very heart of this case and the campaign team are asking for your help by writing to your MP to highlight the facts and to ask for support. And please, could you consider joining the growing numbers of Jeremy supporters, which include human rights campaigner Peter Tatchell, former JP Diana Waterlow, miscarriage of justice victim Michael O'Brien, Guardian journalist Eric Allison, former MP Andrew Hunter, human rights barrister Flo Krauss and myself, Susan Penhaligon. If you need persuading of the truth of Jeremy's fight to present the new evidence before a court, you can read the detailed breakdown in the disclosure booklet at www.jeremy-bamba.co.uk Thank you for watching.